Uh, dear participants, thank you very much for joining today's webinar, uh, brought to you by the European Network for Historic Places of Worship, Future for Religious Heritage. Uh, my name is uh, Jordi Merak, and I'm the Executive Officer at FRH, and I'm delighted to present today's speaker, uh, FRH Council Secretary Becky Clark, who is also Director of Churches and Cathedrals at the Church of England. Uh, and who will be conducting today's presentation on the theme, Cathedral Thinking. I would ask that you please keep your microphones muted for the duration of the presentation. And once the presentation concludes, we'll very much uh, invite you to share any comments, reflections, or questions that you may have. And um, we'll be recording this presentation in order to share it uh, in the future, but we'll cut out any interventions uh, at the end to respect your privacy. So um, we'll just keep the, the presentation uh, on video. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, over to you, Becky. Thanks very much, Jordi. It's very good to see you. It's a small group, but an interested one. So we will um, we will hopefully have some interesting time to chat as well. Um, I am going to try not to talk too fast. I went to my local coffee shop this morning and the lady behind the counter said, you look very tired and gave me a latte with four shots of espresso in. So I'm incredibly awake. So if I talk too fast, please tell me to slow down. Um, we're talking today about cathedral thinking, which is a, uh, a concept that obviously stretches back to medieval times, but in terms of how it's articulated and how people talk about cathedral thinking in the modern world, it's actually a relatively recent um, idea. The concept of cathedral thinking has often been used to mean long term. But the fact that it comes from the concept of building a cathedral of this long term intergenerational project is one that makes it very relevant to the conversation about the role of religious heritage. The concept has been applied to things like space exploration, to city planning, to long term goals that require generations of foresight so that they can be realized and enjoyed by those who are yet to come. This talk is part of the new European Bauhaus initiative, which I'm going to talk a little bit about and about the role of the Future for Religious Heritage Network as part of that major initiative. But to start off with, I want to talk about this quote. A rock pile ceases to become a rock pile the moment a single man or woman contemplates it, bearing within them the image of a cathedral. The idea of cathedral thinking is rooted in the concept that in religious heritage in these very long-term major projects, we see something that is not about individuals, not about a single time. It's about that place being important and significant and looked after for generations to come. All instances of cathedral thinking require the same foundations, a far reaching vision, a well thought out blueprint and a shared commitment to long-term implementation. In a corporate world and in sometimes a political world that's obsessed with change, with speed, with doing the right thing right now, and with facilities and tools that are designed to speed us up rather than slow us down, cathedral thinking is fundamentally a counter-cultural way of looking at growth, development, and sustainability. The concept of cathedral thinking seems to have a natural resonance with lots of different industries and areas. Corporate organizations have seized on it as a way of trying to improve their profitability. They look at it in terms of things like marketing and brand strategy, their corporate social responsibility, and their purpose-driven economies, whereby they try and convince us that they are doing social good for the long term, and that's why we should buy their brand, their product, their service. Cathedral thinking is also discussed in relation to the need for corporates to respond to consumers' increasing awareness of their choices. Plastic in the ocean, sweatshops in Bangladesh, all these social and economic concerns that increasingly are influencing people's choices. An article a couple of years ago said that research clearly indicates that ethical attributes inform brand choice. So companies have started to try and use the idea of cathedral thinking to articulate how good they are, how socially driven, how long term they are in their planning. Now, it's up to you as consumers how much of that you might believe. But more recently still, the European Union launched the new European Bauhaus. And this initiative is described on this slide, a creative interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary initiative convening a space of encounter to design future ways of living 
situated at the crossroads between art, culture, social inclusion, science and technology. It talks about the Green Deal, it talks about sustainable futures and it talks about beauty. And this, to my mind, is much closer to the concept of what cathedral thinking is supposed to be about. And this is the place where religious heritage has a particular role to play. Cathedral thinking has also been used to uh, look at ethical choices in relation to the climate emergency. And this quote from Greta Thunberg does articulate exactly how ambitious we have to be in tackling these long-term challenges. We need to lay the foundation before we know exactly how to build the ceiling. She may not be quite right about the way that we go about building cathedrals, but the concept is a really important one when it comes to the sort of long-term planning. Now, clearly, those who are talking about cathedral thinking in lots of contexts aren't usually literally talking about cathedrals, but they do use pictures of cathedrals to illustrate what's going on. And this obviously is the Sagrada Familia, and you can understand why this would be used. It's still very much in the process of being built. It was begun in 1882. And the last current predictions I saw for its completion were about 2032. There may be people on the call who know better than me about that. If that's true, it'll be a 150 year build period, which gives us a real life glimpse into the process that goes into long-term planning that will not be completed within a single person's lifetime. I can't wait to see it finished. But today I want to talk about cathedral thinking as a concept and how we might see religious heritage as a tool for growing sustainable, beautiful communities. How do we push through new ideas and new initiatives and innovations within institutions and buildings and places that instinctively think in centuries? And how do we hold the creative tension between wanting to do things now and wanting to do things that will last forever? So firstly, what do we actually mean when we talk about sustainability? Of course, we talk about environmental issues, and I'm going to come back to that really crucial part of both cathedral thinking and the new European Bauhaus, but it's more than that. So let's think about what religious heritage like cathedral buildings can teach us. The cathedrals like this one in Cologne are images of solidity and continuity. They've always been there and they'll be rebuilt. Working with cathedrals has taught me so many things about what it means to be the center of a place that's really built up and confidence in itself. It's about the importance of being able to take risks, knowing that the place will endure. It's about the importance of the way that unexpected people can relate to religious heritage buildings and spiritual places. There's often quite an unexpected response, even from those who would not say that they had any faith of their own. It's about the value of authenticity and continuity and this full idea of sustainability. Within the UK, we have a national planning framework which dictates town planning for most of the country. That has a definition of sustainable development in it, which says that it's about meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, I hate that definition because it implies that you should take everything you can from the present in order to allow future generations to continue to take, to meet their needs. I much prefer the definition of sustainability from the UN General Assembly, which had a report on environment and development where it came up with this three pillars approach. Sustainability, which is about social, economic and environmental sustainability, which all together work to try and create this network of things that are truly going to be sustainable. People and planet and profits in balance. Cathedrals embody time, which is another form of sustainability, just being able to be in existence for a long time. Some represent a particular moment in time, of course. This is a picture of the twin cathedrals at Coventry, uh, which are made up of ruins that were created following the bombing in World War II and a 20th century response in the new cathedral that you can see on the right-hand side as you look at the slide. These two cathedrals speak powerfully because they're preserved and yet they're also alive. The new cathedral was actually the fastest built cathedral in England. The foundation stone was laid in 1956, the bombing was in 1942, and the building itself was consecrated in 1962. Compare this to somewhere like Portsmouth Cathedral in southern England, which was begun in 1188, and because of various delays and changes in plan and extensions, it wasn't actually formally completed until 1991, which was 803 years later. So six years to build a cathedral feels incredibly quick. 
But actually, in terms of modern buildings that we see going up around our cities, new housing development, new office blocks, six years would be considered a really long build period. Expectations of what can be achieved in what sort of time are often in conflict with organisational planning. So whether it's creating new places or trying to change existing ones, buildings may come and go, but culture tends to endure unless dramatically shaken. What the new European Bauhaus and the Green Deal are demanding of us is that we think longer term about how we can shape our culture within the places that we live. How we can stop demanding instant gratification and fast results. Religious heritage like at Coventry and Portsmouth and so many places across Europe can show us the benefits of that proper long term thinking. Winston Churchill, who was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, famously gave this quote when he was talking about the restoration of the Houses of Parliament in London after a bombing in World War I. And he made this statement, we shape our buildings thereafter, they shape us. Now, what I think he was saying was that the form of a place affects the outworkings of the organisation that uses it. So the type of buildings you have affects the way your organisation might run. It will affect the way people feel about coming to your town or city. It will affect whether they want to come at all, whether they feel like it's a good place to, to spend their time, to live, to go to school, to worship, to enjoy their lives. In this way, the incredible ability that religious heritage has to adapt can be a real teacher to others. Almost all religious heritage buildings have adapted and changed over the years. Now, sometimes this is traumatic. These two maps show the synagogues in, in this case, Germany, but you could apply this map to almost any country in mainland Europe before World War II and those that are still in use in the present day. And this is part of a mapping exercise the Foundation for Jewish Heritage has recently done. The deliberate ruination and the vast and tragic loss of the synagogues is often an extreme example of the way that religious buildings can change places. But there's also the side of things that says that religious buildings can adapt to allow new uses in addition to or sometimes instead of religious worship. This is an example of a 13th century Dominican church in Maastricht, which is now a bookshop and a cafe. This would be considered quite controversial in some parts of Europe, particularly if it were in more of the Catholic or Orthodox traditions where sacred space is considered a different concept than it is in more Protestant understandings of Christianity. But in this case, this church wasn't needed for worship anymore. And this is a fantastic use of a religious heritage building, which is now back at the center of the city. Cathedrals in particular have been very successful in a long-term way by a particular long-term definition. And that is endurance rather than necessarily this constant cycle of growth. Cathedrals in England have gone through fallow periods where they haven't been so successful. These two are Derby on the left and Lichfield on the right. During the 18th century, these two cathedrals and many others in England were very much neglected. Some of them still hadn't been repaired since the English Civil War. The medieval parish church of Derby, which is on the site of today's cathedral, was in such a terrible state of decay that it was actually demolished entirely apart from this west tower, which now forms the entrance to the new cathedral. And nearly all of the West Front statues you can see on Litchfield Cathedral, this marvellous three-spired church, are actually Victorian replacements because those that were destroyed during the Reformation were never replaced. Yet the institution of the cathedral endured through all of this, through all these centuries of neglect and of changing of use. The clear narrative in the world today, in capitalism, in often a lot of politics, is that success equals continuous growth. You must always have more and more and more and more. But that's not true for religious heritage and it's not true for proper sustainability. We're not sh shops that are trying to sell goods. We're not goods to be traded. We're trying to build in a longer term sense of understanding so that people can have a better quality of life over the longer term. I think religious heritage has a lot to teach us. This is Wells Cathedral in southwest England. Um, it's an amazing building, absolutely worth a visit if you're ever in that part of the world. But it's particularly relevant when we're talking about the way that long term planning works in relation to cathedrals and religious heritage. High up in the roof of Wells Cathedral, there are two changes in the style of the building as you go along. Now, you can't see these from ground level. 
they're only evident if you look at the way the carpenters have done joints in the roof trusses or the way that the masons have worked particular pieces of stone. But those changes represent two really key events, which were very much not part of the plan, but which have become part of the current building and the present way that Wells Cathedral operates. So from 1209 to 1213, England was excommunicated from the Catholic Church, sort of first Brexit. Second one's not going that well, I'm afraid, but the, uh, the first one was because the Pope and the King of England had had a falling out over who was going to be Archbishop of Canterbury. So the Pope said, no more uh, communion for you, and you are not allowed to build any more churches. So there was this break in cathedral and church building in England. The carpenters who were working on the cathedral may have stopped working on the cathedral, but they didn't stop working on other things. They went and worked on houses and castles and bridges. They continued to refine and develop their craft. And when they were allowed back up into the roof at Wells about 10 years later, they brought with them these changes. You can see this incorporated into the building. The building that happened in the 1220s is much better than that that happened 10 years earlier. The second break in building in the roof at Wells is a bit more devastating. From 1246 to 1248, the Black Death was at its peak in England. And as you all know, in total between 1346 and 1353, across Europe, the whole of Europe, around 60% of the population died during the Black Death. It's a scale of loss unequaled before or since. Entire villages got abandoned and were never repopulated. The event changed the face of Europe forever, and at Wells, the work had to stop because, we gather from the records, the stonemasons died. It must have been an absolutely terrifying series of events. When work did eventually resume some years later, the new carpenters show a marked lack of skill compared to those who came before them. They had no access to that legacy, that training, that history of understanding. They couldn't learn from those who'd gone before them, and so their skills were lesser because of it. And slowly they relearned, and you can see them getting better as the cathedral moves westward. In part, they copied the joints of those who'd come before them, trying to practice what had been lost. Cathedral thinking and long-term planning is not immune to crisis. It isn't a way of saying that nothing bad will ever happen. In fact, many bad things have happened to and with religious heritage. But we have an ability to look back as well as forwards and to learn from and build on what's gone before, which gives the whole a better chance of surviving. And I think that's one of the most important lessons of sustainability. Never discount what's been learned before. In other cathedrals, we see the flip side of this sort of development at Wells. At York Minster on the left of this slide, we have an arch on the bottom, which is apparently built for a different building to the arch on the top. You can see how much they misalign. Um, the walls here are decidedly less than symmetrical, and that's because the aisles were actually added later and the triforium was added later still. So you have these multiple levels of building that show how the different developments have impacted what we have today. The photograph on the right is from Canterbury Cathedral, and I think this is probably just somebody miscalculated. Can you imagine how annoying to get up to the roof of the cathedral and have all of these wonderful arches and realise the last one had been miscalculated and it wasn't going to work? We don't know whether this was something they just couldn't correct and they didn't have time to. They're under quite a lot of time pressure in trying to complete Canterbury Cathedral. Um, but this wonderful, slightly drunken looking arch is still there today. You can find multiple examples of this all over Europe. Always look in your religious heritage buildings, look for the things that don't quite fit because that's where a lot of the fun is to be found. Crucially though, the mistakes that we see today, like these ones at York and Canterbury, are the mistakes that are survivable. There are mistakes that were a bit more serious. This is a model of Lincoln Cathedral in Eastern England. Uh, Lincoln is one of the glories of Gothic architecture. It's absolutely incredible. It used to have a spire shown on this model. Now the spire here collapsed not once, but twice in 1237 and then again in 1549. When that second spire was completed in the 14th century, it became, probably unknown to it, the tallest building in the world, which it took the title from the Great Pyramid at Giza, which had held it for 3000 years. This was a hugely ambitious thing they were trying to build, but it didn't work. And it almost destroyed the entire cathedral when it came crashing down. Because of these collapses, if you look east to west at the roof line at Lincoln Cathedral, and if you're ever there, you can go and do a roof tour and have a look at this yourself, you'll see that the line doesn't run straight. The roof is wonky. 
And that's because when they rebuilt a little bit like the Euro tunnel, they did it from both ends. But unlike the Euro tunnel, they didn't quite manage to match up in the middle. So you have this wonky bit where it doesn't quite meet. You can see the scar of the ambition that didn't quite work. And uh, Lincoln today has no spire. When we talk about mistakes, there are obviously those that we don't choose as well. This is a picture of Notre Dame. And when the cathedral burned in April 2019, the world was horrified. But this isn't the first time that Notre Dame had suffered a major fire. The difference here was that it happened on our watch and suddenly we had to choose how to respond to it. And we could see it happening in real time on Twitter. We had to take responsibility for decisions about what would happen next or rather the French government did advised by lots of experts. And there was the possibility at the beginning that someone might have to take the blame for this. The world seemed to collectively feel like this shouldn't have happened. It was a wrong thing. And we had no frame of reference for really processing it. People were, were devastated in a way they didn't quite know how to articulate, not just by the loss of something so significant architecturally, but by the loss of something they couldn't quite define. Here was a need for a modern and immediate response to something that we'd thought was eternal and unchanging. People tend to assume that religious heritage has always been there and it's always looked like that. So when something happens to it, they don't quite know how to react. Politicians weighed in as they always do and said it would be rebuilt in five years, obviously not. And those who wished to be see seen as charitable opened up their pocketbooks. There was 850 million euros pledged within the first month after the fire. I would be fascinated to know how much of that money actually materialized for the repair. Those who knew Notre Dame really intimately, those who cared for it, and those who care for religious heritage all across the world, knew that actually this wasn't as devastating as it seemed, that this was a temporary pause, not a full stop. Cathedral thinking allowed them to resist the sensationalism that politicians and the media tried to put on this. They did, good planners that they are, accept the money, but they were able to proceed with dignity and confidence in the replanning. Now, the recent plans that have been published are now subject to another debate. But all that shows is that there's a proper process of engagement going on as to what happens. This is cathedral thinking in action, resisting that um, inclination to try and work very, very quickly and respond to immediate sensations rather than the long term need. So when it comes to religious heritage and teaching people how to build strong long term communities, how do you focus on the stories that you really want to tell? This is Robert Louis Stevenson, and he said this, I never weary of great churches. It is my favorite kind of mountain scenery. Mankind was never so happily inspired as when it made a cathedral. And it seems the public, at least in the UK, agree with him. 85% of people in England go to a church at least once a year, and 55% of tourist visitors will visit a church or cathedral. You can't tell the history of Europe without its religious heritage. You would miss far too much. And you can tell almost all of the heritage through religion, through almost all of the history, sorry, through religious heritage. They are this phenomenal free, largely free international museum. And so it's not surprising that people have this interest. But I think part of the appeal of religious heritage is this continuity. This is a photo of Rochester Cathedral and Rochester Castle on the near the south coast of England. The cathedral there is all lit up and alive. There will have been services happening there that day that the photo was taken, as opposed to the castle, which is sitting there ruined and in darkness, looking very pretty, but it has no use. Religious heritage continues to be relevant because it continues to have a use. It continues to be something people care about, they visit and they want to be a part of. And Rochester Cathedral is at the heart of that city. It is, provides a beautiful place to go, it provides cafes, it provides tourist visitors, and it provides a place that people can anchor their understanding of where they live. Those of us who help care for religious heritage, care for the history of our places, both good and bad and easy and difficult. But the buildings also do speak inherently of faith and of the people who lived in that place in the past, of people who loved it and worked to make it beautiful and significant, and we should respect and remember that legacy. Now, of course, not everyone is comfortable with the legacies of faith and history. And indeed, in a lot of countries, I think probably all of them, the history of religion is not altogether a happy one. The way you're welcomed into a religious building is a big part of how you can understand the way that it's there for you. Um, this is a sign that was found at a church and it says, caution, worship in progress. Um, 
I don't know about you, but if somebody tells me to be cautious, I tend to think it's not a good place to go. I'm not sure people need to be warned off coming into worship. The way that people are welcomed in and the sort of signs that they use are a really important part of how um, we can make people feel that religious heritage is part of their history or not. Similarly, this slide, which the bottom line is the key one, it says this church is reserved for private prayer. Now in English, the word reserved, if somewhere is reserved, you don't sit there. It means you shouldn't be there. It's for somebody else. A sign that said, please feel free to use this chapel for quiet prayer and reflection wouldn't change the use of the chapel, but it might change the users. It might make different people feel that they could be welcome. Increasingly, and particularly true in Western and Northern Europe, we're seeing secularization and a lack of religious education. This is the reality, and it's not something uh, that we can um, really fight against. We just need to make sure that when we're opening up religious heritage and explaining its importance, we are helping people understand the value of religious heritage and helping them to learn and engage. How many signs forbidding entry are there in religious heritage sites that you're involved in? How many ropes or barriers? Are those things explained or are they just there with people expected to understand why they can't approach the high altar or can't go into a particular area of the synagogue or mosque? If a child were to run under the ropes, would your clergy, your staff, your volunteers be fine with it? Would they smile and, and help out or would they scowl and tell the parents off? A lot of places do do this welcome brilliantly, but increasingly I think it's important that we make sure religious heritage is as welcoming and as open as possible to those who have no background in it, in order to be able to explain why it continues to be important. We should be opening up possibilities rather than shutting them down. So what defines cathedral thinking? At its heart, it's a matter of how we make judgments. Judgments like how we welcome people in or how we plan for the long term. But it's also about how we respond to the political situation of the day. This is about what Aristotle and is the um, uh, Aristotle in, Ro in Athens, sorry. It's about what Aristotle called practical wisdom. Phrenesis, which is the Greek term that he coined, is a skill that requires a lifelong commitment to develop. He said, neither by nature nor contrary to nature do virtues arise in them. Rather, they are adapted and we are made perfect by habit. What Aristotle was saying was basically, you can become better at making decisions if you practice doing it well. Cathedral thinking is part of this and it cannot happen just purely as an intellectual exercise. It's something that has to be practiced and played out in real life situations. It's only through an accumulation of practical lived experience that it comes into its fullest potential. And again, religious heritage can be a way of teaching communities how decisions can have these long-term impacts. Jeffrey Vickers, who is a academic who studies judgment quite a lot said that judgment is an elusive quality easier to recognize than to define and easier to define than to teach what is seen as a good judgment is in the immediate term may well in the longer term be seen to be a poor judgment so Coventry Cathedral that I showed a picture of earlier used these innovative techniques these new concretes but those materials are failing now and we see that initial judgment to use the most modern materials available as a bad one We'll have to try something new all over again or go back to the older techniques that we know work. Perhaps one of the clearest conclusions to draw from this is that when we're trying to consider cathedral thinking, we have to recognize our own limitations and our own inability to do very much more than sustain and pass on what we've inherited. A decision maker can't be separate from the situation in which they're making the decision. What cathedral thinking demands of us as decision makers, as planners, as those who are looking at sustainability, is that we deliberately and carefully combine our contemporary understanding and perceptions with discernment. This is a photograph of Liverpool Cathedral under construction. It shows you how daring you sometimes have to be in thinking long term. Liverpool is the UK's largest cathedral by size. It's the third largest in Europe. And it's what you can see here is about 180 feet off the floor of the cathedral, the concrete girdle being built, built into the tower. That girdle now carries the girders, which are designed to support the ringing chamber. And today that ring of bells is the heaviest and the highest ringing peal of bells in the world. 
At this stage in the work, the choir and the transepts had been completed, but the central tower in the nave was still to be built, and nobody had tried this method of construction before. The engineers had to design it all from scratch, and they had to trust that it would work. So cathedral thinking doesn't always mean playing it safe or only making small changes. Sometimes a long-term view can allow you to take risks that would be far too much for someone focused on shorter term outcomes. And I think with religious heritage, we can think about that when dealing with politicians in particular. They have to work to election cycles. We can work to longer term goals that help to build communities that will really, really last. In this context, the concept of the common good comes into the play. The main point of reference for judgment should be what happens that's going to make the longest term beneficial impact. What makes this really hard to do, though, is that judgments about common good over decades or centuries can't be judged only by the outcomes that you can see in the short term, and especially not in the sort of short term reporting cycles that we see in the media. For Aristotle, it was the intent behind a decision that really mattered. And as, when it comes to that, religious heritage can be clear about articulating its art intent and its long term aspirations for community growth in a really positive way while taking the appropriate risks. This is a description of the Church of England that was given to me by somebody, I think only partly as a joke, um, who represented the Southern European Catholic Church at a European religious heritage conference that I went to. I'd given a talk about the extended use of church buildings to allow communities to use them for things like post offices, uh, for play groups, for all sorts of different activities. Um, I think I might have this printed on a t-shirt and sell it in all our cathedral shops. I think it's quite a good description of the Church of England. There can be an inherent tension between religious heritage as it has been and as it can be. It's both a symbol of solidity and continuity, but it's also a place of change and innovation. Our progress on environmental issues is one way of showing this. In England, for example, we have 250 churches shown on this map, which are already at carbon net zero. And we have solar panels shown here at Gloucester Cathedral on the roof of a number of our medieval buildings. We've got a long way to go, but uh, actually with great thanks to, to Catherine who's on this call, we are getting there. What this proves is you can make a contribution to tackling the climate emergency, even if you care for some of the most histo important historic buildings in the world. Religious heritage is leading the way in showing how heritage buildings can be at the forefront of dealing with climate change. Additionally, we can change the interiors of churches to allow them to be used for new purposes. But we also want to show that this is a place that's rooted in its community. It's only by recognizing that religious heritage exists at the same time in the then and the now, and in the time yet to come, that good decisions can be made. You look at what you've inherited, you appreciate and care for that, but you also don't shy away from adapting it and doing new things to make sure it's fit for purpose in the future. Now, we're not gonna get it right every time, any more than those who went before us did, but we can at least be aware of all the possible implications of the decisions that we're making. Change is never straightforward. But we can think about it in terms of who we want to be and where we want to go. So here is the challenge for those of us caring for religious heritage. What do we want religious heritage to be and what part do we want it to play in the future of Europe? We need to talk about the history, the magnificence, the significance and importance of these places, but in the context of what it means for society today and in a way that recognises the issues faced by those on less long term schedules. So we can do things like respond to the climate emergency. We can make sure we pay staff properly if they're working in our religious buildings. We can reach out to and work with marginalized communities all across Europe. We can open our doors when other doors are being shut to provide the sort of things that people in communities really, really need. And we can tell the difficult stories. We can accept and understand and represent the complex histories of Europe and of the places where our religious heritage is and be places for difficult debates to take place in a safe space. Diversifying the use of religious heritage buildings is part of this, as is enhancing welcome, as I talked about earlier. And keeping religious heritage buildings open for worship at the same time as doing all of these social things is not contradictory. It's bold, it's right, and it has a strong historical precedent. 
George Orwell, the English author, wrote in 1942 that whenever I talk to anyone or read the writings of anyone, I feel that intellectual honesty and balanced judgment have disappeared from the face of the earth. Everyone is simply putting a case with deliberate suppression of his opponent's point of view. Everyone is utterly heartless towards people who are outside the immediate range of his own interests. Quite harsh. He basically thought that society had de devolved to the point where people would represent their own interests above and beyond any others. That this short-termism and self-interest were the only things that people were making decisions by. And it's that that means that religious heritage continues to be important now. It's important in the modern European world precisely because it does not bend to all the prevailing political winds. We can judge things against longer term sets of criteria. By defining success as enduring, as continuing, rather than as growing, we can be countercultural to a place that tells us we have to continually demonstrate ongoing improvement. Now, of course, this definition can be a way of stifling change, which is not what we would want to do. But if it's understood properly, it's precisely this approach which will allow the sort of risk taking that schemes like the Green Deal and the new European Bauhaus demand of us to make the changes that we need to see a sustainable Europe. Religious heritage buildings and organisations can use the strong bedrock that they have to avoid the sort, this sort of short-term political expediency that Orwell talks about. The long perspective of places like cathedrals gives a lie to the idea that the fruit has to be available on demand immediately and in any flavour preferred that day. This is a sort of community development that blooms in its own time, not ours. Many of you will be familiar with the Borough Charter which says that cultural significance means aesthetic, historic, scientific, social or spiritual value for past, present or future generations. The context of a place incorporates coexistence with other elements of significance. A religious heritage building doesn't have to choose whether it's a religious site or a heritage site or a tourism venue or a community resource. It can be all of those things one at the same time. We don't have to be worried about conflicts when it comes to religious heritage. We should embrace the complexity of the long-term existence, which means that this place can signify all those different things at different times to different groups of people. Cathedral thinking is not a straight road through a known valley. It's an iterative approach which draws on the past, acknowledges and learns from mistakes and makes decisions based on an ever shifting set of contexts and criteria. So far as is practically possible, cathedral thinking minimizes the individual in preference of the long term and the whole. This is particularly important for those who are actually making decisions to understand. By encouraging cathedral thinking through schemes like the new European Bauhaus, we can show quality and robustness and that it doesn't mean doing nothing. It means doing things incredibly well and with long term aspirations in mind and a different set of priorities. It means telling difficult stories unblinkingly and openly, and it means that the challenges of the past inform the decisions that we make today. The past, the present and the future are not neat blocks that proceed in an orderly fashion. They're a tangled mixture of different ideas and influences of different events and challenges. And sometimes something that seems fleeting or inconsequential or outrageous to us might in time come to be very profound, but similarly, the things that to us feel like terrible challenges, things that we will never be able to overcome, might in time simply be absorbed and noticeable only for those who are studying the, the building or the place very closely. Cathedral thinking for us does mean all of these things, thinking long term, planning now for the next generation, resisting pressure to do things quickly and taking risks through a good process of judgment. But in particular, it means being proud of the long history of religious heritage and confident in speaking about the things that it can teach communities today and the part it has to play in shaping the future. The new European Bauhaus and the Future for Religious Heritage Network aim to support beautiful, sustainable and inclusive forms of living. Religious heritage can show us how to achieve all three of these. And I believe religious heritage is fundamentally important to the future of Europe. I'm proud to be part of FRH and the networks that it supports. There are some website links here to FRH itself and to the Cathedral Thinking Network, which really started a lot of this off. There's also a link to the FRH 10 year anniversary appeal, which at the moment, if you donate, can we have it, any donation doubled by an anonymous donor. 
So we're particularly looking to try and ensure that we have a sustainable future for the network going forward, as well as for our religious heritage. But I'll just finish by saying thank you. I'd be very keen to discuss any of this um, with people on the call and to hear what you think about when you think about long term planning and religious heritage and its role in the future of the places of Europe. So thank you very much.